found your place in Isaiah 38 there at home, find verse 17 and let me read it in your hearing. This is the word of God. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Wow, what a powerful and really an amazing verse. I want to preach tonight out of this chapter on this subject, a new lease on life. A new lease on life. It's about Hezekiah. And if you've read the chapter as you've done the memory work, you kind of got this idea that it's about King Hezekiah. And really it's amazing. In this wonderful and rich chapter of the book of Isaiah, we have the historical account of, he, of King Hezekiah being miraculously healed by God from a deadly sickness. A sickness, by the way, that up to that point there was no cure for. And it had found its way into the palace, into the king's chamber, into the king's bed, and into the king himself. And now he's laying on his deathbed. King Hezekiah then makes a symbolic and illustrative parallel between physical healing, which he experienced himself at the hand of God, and spiritual healing, which he also experienced himself at the hand of God. Both of which, the physical and the spiritual healing, he experienced because he asked God. And that's so powerful. James tells us in James 4, Two, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Uh, James speaks here of the extremes that many are willing to go to to get what they want. Many of us are willing to go to to get what we want. I remind you that he's talking to Christians, James is, the scattered Christians. And many, many times we are willing to go to great extremes to get what we want while failing to do, to do that one thing that guarantees us every time that we will get what we need. And that one thing is this. Ask God. Pray to God. Seek the face of God. Here's the thing. And let me be very, very clear. Asking God does not guarantee us everything we want. I want you to underscore that in your mind because I don't want to be misunderstood or misinterpreted or misquoted. Asking God does not guarantee us everything we want, but it does guarantee us everything we need. Let me say it this way. God doesn't promise us physical healing. Now, it's certainly within his power to heal physically, and we know that. And he has many times healed multitudes of people. And the scriptural record is clear, as is the historical record all the way up to the present. God heals people. Maybe there are people that you prayed for, for physical healing, and then they were healed. And now some will say, well, that's a coincidence. Or some may say, well, the doctors figured it out. Listen, you and I couldn't figure out two plus two if God hadn't given us the, the wherewithal to do it. Remember Jesus saying in John 15, 5, without me, ye can do nothing. We couldn't even suck breath into our lungs and pump blood throughout our heart, uh, with our heart throughout our body if it weren't for the life giving of God. And so it's all to be attributed to him. And we have to be careful, especially as God's people, to give God credit and to give him glory for these things. The narrative would indicate that it is absolutely right to ask God for physical healing uh, on the behalf of those who are suffering and even on our own behalf. Right? If we had to pull a verse out that would indicate that, that would say that clearly, uh, I think of Philippians 4.6. Be careful for nothing, but, and here's the underlined part, the underscored part, the highlighted and the bold part, in everything by prayer. In everything 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. All of them. All of your requests, make them known unto God. And so it's right uh, to pray for physical healing. But there is no guarantee that God will heal physically. There are New Testament examples in the epistles where God did not heal. Many examples of that, that God just did not heal. And we don't know why, or do we? I think we do, that the works of God might be made manifest. That's what Jesus says in John chapter 9. There is no guarantee that God will heal physically. He may, he can, but it's not guaranteed. And he doesn't every time. But there is a consistent scriptural promise to heal spiritually to save, to forgive. Uh, whether it's the publican in Luke chapter 18 who says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Or the thief on the cross in Luke 23 saying unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Or the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 who said to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Uh, when a sinner turns to Christ and asks for salvation, the answer is always the same. It's always guaranteed. Paul sums it up in Romans 10, 13, quoting from Joel 2, 32, and bringing into focus God's inclusion of the Gentiles. He says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed when we call on him for spiritual healing, i.e. salvation or forgiveness. When we ask for grace and we ask for mercy every single time God comes through. That's the direct promise of God as authoritatively conveyed by Paul. And that which is symbolically illustrated in our text by Hezekiah. There is, in our text, there is recognition, there is resurrection, and there is redemption. Uh, Hezekiah recognized the impossible situation he was in. The Bible tells us that he was sick unto death. That means he had a deadly disease for which there was no cure. The only option he had, humanly speaking, was to die. He recognized his impossible situation. And then God resurrected him as it were from the dead. He was literally on his deathbed with an incurable disease. And yet, as we continue reading and the narrative unfolds, what we find out is that God raised him up. There's resurrection built right into it. And we are told in Ephesians 2, 1, and you hath he, talking to Christians, hath he quickened. It means to make alive or to bring to life or to resurrect. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And God redeemed him redeemed Hezekiah, uh, so there's recognition, there's, re there's resurrection, there's redemption. He redeemed him. He says in verse number 17, and that's the text that we read, and everything's going to be built around. It's the key to the chapter. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins, praise the Lord, behind thy back. This physical healing that Hezekiah experienced at the hand of God reminded him of how God had healed him spiritually. This sickness from which God had healed him reminded him of his sins from which God had forgiven him. Notice two things from our text, and we have two points this evening. We see first in verse number eight, beginning, uh, the first eight verses rather, the dilemma that Hezekiah got out of. The dilemma Hezekiah got out of. First, we see the peril he faced. Now look with me at verse number one of our text in Isaiah 38, verse number one. The Bible says this, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Two things concerning this peril. 
First, we see the deadly sickness. We are told that Hezekiah was sick unto death. Uh, from a human standpoint, the timing could not have been worse. Uh, Judah was facing a Syrian invasion, remember Sennacherib, and the Assyrians were besieging and going to invade. And I don't know that there's ever a convenient time or a good time to fall ill or to develop a deadly disease. But on a scale from bad to worse, this had to be the worst time for the king to be down. Not only was his life in jeopardy, the whole country was in big trouble. The deadly sickness. Then secondly, we see in this peril that he faced the divine sentence. Notice with me the messenger. He says in verse number one, look at it again. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him. Interesting. If I'm sick, I'm expecting to see the doctor. But instead of the man of medicine coming to Hezekiah in his sickness, the man of God comes to him. The fact of the matter is, by this time, there was nothing the doctors could do for Hezekiah. Know this, if there was something that the doctors could do, if there would have been a medical cure, it would have been implemented by this time. They would have writ, wrote him out a prescription and given it to him, and he'd have gone down to the pharmacy and got his prescription, taken his medicine, and he'd been over this, and through this, there wasn't one. He was facing a deadly disease from which there was no cure. And so instead of the doctor appearing here in Isaiah 38, the man of God comes, Isaiah comes, the prophet comes. And so we read that Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him, the messenger. Then too we see the message. Isaiah came bearing a message from God. Now, if I hear that someone's coming with a message for God, from God, I'm thinking, okay, finally, good news. Finally, good news, right? Well, here's what he says. Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. And I can Im imagine Hezekiah on his deathbed, sick and weak and famished and frail, uh, mustering up all that he could when he saw the man of God and heard him say, Thus saith the Lord, Hezekiah, here's a message. I have a message from you straight from God, straight from heaven, uh, hot off heaven's presses. Here's what God says. And I can see Hezekiah, maybe a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Maybe, okay, God's about to do something big. And the message is this, set thine house in order for thou shalt die and not live. It's not good news. And God's people, listen, we ought to be a hopeful people. If anybody has hope, it's the people of God. And we should never, ever lose that hope. And by the way, it was bad news. And the wording, and, and know this, Hezekiah was pay, paying attention to the wording of Isaiah. Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die. That's a command from heaven. That is a sovereign command. Thou shalt die. And by the way, not live. Huh. And he doubles it up there. But Hezekiah, praise God, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, doesn't lose hope. It's not good news. This is like a punch in the stomach that knocks the breath out of you and leaves you <gasps> gasping for air. Not only was Judah facing a powerful Assyrian, Assyrian invasion, the king was dying and there was no hope. And further, not only was there no hope, humanly speaking, there was also no heir. The record would indicate that Hezekiah had no son. And therefore, no heir to the throne. If he would have died without an heir, there would have been war from without by the Assyrians and potentially war from within as they attempted to determine who would be king in his stead. The peril he faced. It was a rough situation, church. The peril he faced. Next we see the prayer he prayed. 
Did I mention that he didn't lose hope? That it seemed like all was lost? Listen, if I haven't said this before, and by the way, I have, but if you weren't listening, and I know you were, there is unspeakable, unimaginable, unexplainable power in prayer. And I say that because the edict was this, and by the way, it came from God. Thou shalt die and not live. Do you remember another place in the Minor Prophets where a similar edict went out and the results were different than the edict would have seemed to have indicated? The book of Jonah, right? What was the message that Jonah was to take to Nineveh? Repent and believe the gospel and you shall be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord. And you... No. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. That was the message. Nineveh shall be destroyed. Thou shalt die and not live. And yet in both scenarios, in both instances, one with a man of God, a believer, and the other with sinners, both, in both instances, they turned to God. They cried out to God. They prayed to God. And in both instances, God sent miraculous salvation. <laughs> We're talking about the prayer he prayed. If this would have been any king less than Hezekiah, he may have given up hope. You know, and you've felt that way before, and so have I. What's the use? What's the use? Any other king or any other man less than Hezekiah would have seen every physician, exhausted all of his medical options, and then just rolled over and died. But not Hezekiah. Look with me in the Bible at verses 2 and 3. The Bible tells us this. Then Hezekiah, when? After Isaiah said, Set your house in order. Thou shalt die and not live. What does Hezekiah do? Here's what he does. It says he turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah, the Bible says, wept sore. This prayer of Hezekiah's is a prayer of fervency. Can you sense the heat? Can you sense the desperation? It says he besought the Lord. He says, oh Lord, I beseech thee. It means to humble oneself and to cry out in desperation, it means to plead with, it means to beg, like a beggar would beg alms of somebody who, could, who was in a position to help him. Admitting his need, confessing his weakness, his poverty. Further, it says he wept sore. This was a prayer of fervency. The kind James tells us availeth much. Well, let's see if James was on to something. A prayer of fervency. Then, too, this prayer of Hezekiah's is a prayer of faith. It's a prayer of faith. Look at what he says. And we need to examine this, and it's important. He says this. Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee. What is it that he wants God to remember? He says, remember this. Remember how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. Now, Hezekiah isn't demanding that God consider the works that he's done and that somehow God is beholden to him or owes him something. This isn't Matthew chapter 7, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many marvelous works? Uh, look at all that we've done, buddy, you owe us something. This is not at all that. First of all, he's beseeching God. He's pleading with God. He's desperate and he's, and he's crying out to God and he's weeping. There's sore weeping. 
And he says, remember how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. He's not demanding that God consider his works that he's done and that somehow God owes him something far from that. Hezekiah is pleading with God based not on his own righteousness, but on God's righteousness. Hezekiah is crossing over here to holy ground. And he's pleading, as it were, church, the righteousness of Christ before the throne of God. Beyond this, he's reiterating how that he has trusted God in the past. And he is continuing to demonstrate that he trusts God even now in the midst of what otherwise seems like a hopeless and impossible situation. The writer of Hebrews tells us, well, I, I want to ask you to turn there quickly if you can. Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 10, here's what he says. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. God is not unrighteous to forget your works and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name. Hezekiah is saying, Remember the works and the love that I have showed toward your name because he knew that God was not unrighteous to forget those things. This eternal scriptural principle uh, is what Hezekiah is pleading as he prays to God. It's not, Lord, I've done this for you and so you do this for me. It's not some kind of I'll scratch your back and then you scratch mine. Uh, it's, it's none of that. Rather, it's this. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. He that soweth to the spirit, you've got to balance it out, right? Shall of the spirit reap what? Life everlasting. Hosea says in Hosea 10, 12, write that in your notes. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, Reap in mercy. That's what Hezekiah is talking about. That's what he's basing it on. Now, turn quickly back with me in your Bible, all the way back to 2 Kings chapter number 18. 2 Kings chapter number 18. Now you're getting into the area where this is recorded and chronicled for us. Uh, in the book of Kings, it's actually 2 Kings chapter 20 that parallels Isaiah 38. But we're going to 2 Kings chapter 18. This is important. 2 Kings chapter 18. You found your place there. Uh, let's look at verses 1 through 7. I'll read and you follow along in your Bible. We're talking about sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. We're talking about Hezekiah's prayer where he says, Lord, I beseech thee, remember. Remember how, I've, remember how I've worked before you. Remember my work of righteousness. Remember these things. Don't forget, O oh God. 2 Kings 18.1 Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Here's the beginning of Hezekiah's reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. Notice, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and brake the images and cut down the groves and brake in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense unto it. And he called it Nehushtan. Notice this verse. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And then just the first part, and the Lord was with him. The key to all of this is verse 5, where the narrator tells us of Hezekiah, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. 
oh, this is foundational. We can't miss this. People who miss this believe false doctrine. They develop false doctrine of it, a works salvation. See, it says Hezekiah. No, no, no. It says Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel. That's what it says. Everything listed that Hezekiah did was based on what Hezekiah believed. He did right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high places. He broke the images. He cut down the groves. He broke in pieces the brazen serpent. He clave to the Lord. He kept his commandments. Why? Verse 5 tells us. Because he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Because he had faith in God. Because he believed God to the saving of his soul. That's why he did those things. His faith worked. That's what it's teaching us. Just like James said, saving faith always does. Here's what all that, all that means. He prayed to God because he trusted in God. When he says, remember, O Lord, I beseech thee, and then he lists those works that he wants God to remember, what he's saying is remember the evidence or the evidences of my faith in you. Remember, O God, that I live the way I live because I trust you. Because you are my God, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, you are my King, you are my everything. Remember that. Don't forget that. I, I beg you, God, don't forget. Don't forget. He prayed to God because he trusted in God. And so we see the peril he faced. He was sick unto death. We see the prayer he prayed. Remember, O oh Lord, I beseech thee. Then thirdly, we see the promises he claimed. The promises he claimed. We're back in Isaiah 38 now. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 4. And read down through verse number 8. Isaiah 38, verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. That's God. That's God saying, I hear you. I see you. I remember. I know you trust me. I know. Now let me show you why that's so important. And let me show you why trusting me is the right thing to do. Wow. Let me start that over again. Verse 4. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee, and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord. That the Lord will do this thing that he had spoken. Behold I will bring again the shadow of the degrees. Which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz. Ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees. By which degrees it was gone down. The promises he claimed. First we see. That God delivered him medically. God delivered him medically. We read in verses 4 and 5 and look at it again. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah saying, and here's the first part. Go and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy years. I will add unto thy days, 15 years. What God is saying here is, you are healed. I will heal you. You cried to me. You put your trust in me. You pointed out the evidences of your trust in me. You were living by faith and faith works. And you've done good. Well done. Well done. And he continued to trust in God and God came through. God delivered him medically. Next we see that God delivered him militarily. <laughs> the Lord goes on to say in verse number 6, And... That polysyndeton, right? And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. There, 
there were those who were wondering, if the king dies, who will deliver us from the Assyrians? Who will protect us? Who, who will defend us if the king dies? The answer, the same one who will deliver you if the king doesn't die, if the king lives, God. You see, deliverance doesn't come from a king. Hezekiah knew it. Deliverance doesn't come from a king. If the king dies, God's still God. And if the king lives, God's still God. He taught Isaiah that, remember, all the way back. At the beginning in Isaiah 6, also I saw uh, in, in, that, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. <laughs> uh, one king had died, an earthly king had died, but the king of kings was still alive. And so who's going to defend us if the king dies? The same one that's going to defend you and deliver you if the king lives. God. God. He says, I will deliver, I will defend. Then thirdly, we see that not only did God deliver him medically and God deliver him militarily, God delivered him miraculously. It's, it was a miraculous deliverance. The Lord goes on to say in verses 7 and 8, look at it with me. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which is gone down in the sundial of Ahaz ten degrees backward. <laughs> so the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. God gave Hezekiah a promise of deliverance and he gave him <clears throat> a miraculous assurance of this deliverance. He's done the same, by the way, for you and I. He's done the same for you and me. Paul tells us in Acts chapter 17 that the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is assurance that God will save those who put their trust in Christ and judge those who reject Christ. He hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Our sundial Moving backward is Jesus Christ rising on the third day. When God allows us to go through things, he does intend to get us out eventually. All of God's people will be delivered eventually, right? He does intend to get us out. But he also has something in the dilemma, in the trial for us. And so he doesn't just want us to get out of the dilemma. He wants us to get something out of the dilemma before we get out of the dilemma. The dilemma Hezekiah got out of, and then what Hezekiah got out of the dilemma. And we'll look quickly. First, what did he get out of it? First, he got a new appreciation of life. He got a new appreciation of life. He was as good as dead. He was on his deathbed. He was sick unto death. God said, thou shalt die and not live. All of that was stacked on him. Don't you know that was heavy? And then he cried unto God and, and prayed toward, uh, to the Lord, and God lifted all of that. Don't you know? that he had a new appreciation for life. Don't you know that the flowers looked different and the grass looked different and the trees looked different and the wind felt different and the smells were different and the sounds were better and the sky was bluer and everything was good in the life of King Hezekiah like never before. He got a new appreciation of life. Let's just read, let's just read what it says in 9 to 12 real quick. We see the despair here. The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, which he, uh, when he had been sick and was recovered from his sickness. He had been sick. Hey, he was recovered from his sickness. And by the way, did we tell you how he got recovered? That's a different message. I said in the cutting off of my days. That's what it was. It was over with. Buddy, it's over with. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. Mine age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness. From day even to night, 
Wilt thou make an end of me? I, uh, Hezekiah is, is reflecting back to the torment and the anguish of his soul and his sickness and the despair and the hopelessness before he turned to God and God recovered him of his sickness. And now he has a new appreciation for life. He remembers that dark time. He remembers that heavy time. He remembers those burdens. But now the light is shining like never before and the burdens have been lifted at Calvary and and there is a new lease on life, and he has a new appreciation of life. Secondly, he got a new appreciation of prayer. Huh. I wonder why. He says in verses 13 and 14, I reckoned till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From day even to night wilt thou make an end of me. Notice this, verse 14. Like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove. Mine eyes fail with looking upward. O Lord, I am oppressed. Undertake for me. He cried, he, he wept, he groaned, he chattered, he mourned, he prayed, and God undertook for him. He was in despair. There was hopelessness. Options A through Z were gone, and the only option he had left was God. And he rolled over in his bed, and he faced the wall, and he prayed to God, and God heard him, and God delivered him. He had a new appreciation for prayer. <laughs> And then we see that he had a new appreciation for humble service. He says in verses 15 and 16, What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. God, done, God has done what he said he'd do. Uh, I shall go softly all the years of, of uh, all my years in the bitterness of my soul. I shall go softly. His a new humility, that pomp, that air of confidence of the flesh. And by the way, I want to be bold in the Lord. But even the best of Christians have a tendency to have confidence in the flesh. Blessed day when God breaks that and it hurts. But oh, what a blessing. O oh Lord, by these things men live, he says in verse 16, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. <laughs> a new appreciation for humble service. Uh, another thing that he got out of it was a deeper love. A deeper love for God derived from a new view of the love of God. He says in the pivotal Key verse, verse number 17, he says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Through his ordeal, Hezekiah learned more about forgiving love, and he learned more about forever love. God had forgiven him. Listen, he was sick, and there are multitudes of reasons why he was sick unto death, and none of, and none of them were because uh, of, of sin that he had committed because it's not recorded there. But here's, here's what it is. If you wrap it all up in a nice bow, here's what it is, that the works of God might be manifest in him, and boy, have they ever been. And these things are written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope that we might have Hezekiah hope. Amen. And what kind of hope is that? That's a good hope right there to have. A deeper love. Then finally, and we'll be done, we see that Hezekiah got a new song. What did he get out of this dilemma? Well, he got some songs out of it. He got a new song or songs, I should say. He says in verses 18 to 20, look at it with me. For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. 
the living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. Songs of praise and songs of prophecy. And here's what I mean. Songs of praise, I think, is self-evident. You see the words he uses, praise, celebration, hoping for truth. Uh, songs of praise, the living, the living, he shall praise thee. And he's talking about in song, by the way. And then, not only songs of praise, but songs of prophecy. And what do I mean by that? Notice the phrase he uses there at the end, um, at the end of verse I'm sorry, 19. I just want to get it in the Bible there. Okay, yeah, at the end of verse 19, he says, the living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. And notice this phrase, and it's so important. I think it's so important. He says, the father to the children shall make known thy truth. Why would I call that a song of prophecy? Well, we've sort of alluded to it previously in the lead up to this. This song and these songs of, of prophecy are the direct result of God's deliverance. It's because Hezekiah didn't have any children. He had no son. And yet, as he sings, he says... The Father shall make known to the children. Now, maybe somebody says, well, he's just talking generally. You know, those fathers that have children, which, by the way, if you don't have children, you're not a father. But, you know, those men who have children, it's for them to make it known. Uh, I think this is way too personal to Hezekiah to speak generally. Does it have that application? Absolutely. But I think he believed God for something even more than that. He didn't have an heir. In fact, if you read, uh, you find out later in 2 Kings that the king after Hezekiah was Manasseh, and that was his son. And it says that Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. Now, he didn't begin to reign, reign until Hezekiah died. And how many years did God say he would give Hezekiah? 15. He extended his life by 15 years. And so... Three years into that, three years after he wrote these words, Manasseh was born to him. And he became king 12 years after that when Hezekiah's 15 years from God expired. What do you think he did with Manasseh in those 12 years? I'll tell you what he did. He said, son, come here. Let daddy sing you a song. Daddy wants to sing you. Jump up here on my knee. Daddy wants to sing you a song. He started by holding him in his arms and singing those songs. And by setting him in his lap, by walking with him in the way, pretty soon Manasseh learned to sing, learned to talk, and he would sing with Daddy. And the Father made known to the children God's truth. Songs of praise, songs of prophecy. This song and these songs of praise and prophecy are the direct result of God's deliverance. But more than that, the realization and the revelation at the beginning of verse 20, where Hezekiah says, the Lord, and we're closing with this, sort of. The Lord was ready to save me. That's Hezekiah's Confession, that's his revelation and his realization. Uh, there was no reluctance or half heartedness in the salvation of God. Hezekiah said, The Lord was, he was in a hopeless situation. He rolled over in his bed, he faced the wall, he prayed to God, God heard him and delivered him. And what Hezekiah found out was the whole time, God was ready. God was ready to deliver him. God, the Lord, was ready to save me, he said. The psalmist says in Psalm 86, 5, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call 
upon thee. In Romans 10, 13, we read, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know why? Because God is ready to save. In Hebrews 7, 25, we read this, Wherefore he, that is Christ, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The salvation of man is wrapped up in the life of God. Uh, God lives to save. He is ready to save. He ever liveth to make intercession. He's able to save to the uttermost. Hezekiah says, the Lord was ready to save me. And so we see the dilemma Hezekiah got out of. And we see what Hezekiah got out of the dilemma. Hezekiah prayed and God gave Isaiah the cure. And he passed that on to the caregivers. Look at verse number 21. And this is where we close. For Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon, uh, upon the boil, and he, that is Hezekiah, shall recover. Notice how the, the Christian, you'll let, me, you'll let me say that, the believer, the man of God, notice how Hezekiah prayed. And in response, God gave the cure through Isaiah to give to them. He didn't just snap his fingers. He didn't just speak the word. He's done that before many times, and we have it on record. Speak the word only, and thy servant shall be healed. And he spoke the word, and he was healed. How many times did he say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk? But then there were other times where he said, he, he, he mixed his spittle with some clay and made a little, and rubbed it on the eyes. And said, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. Thy, shall, you know, thy sight shall be recovered. Remember that? And here he doesn't just snap his fingers. He doesn't just speak the word. He tells Isaiah, and we learned this in 2 Kings chapter 20, that Isaiah's already leaving the palace. He's out in the court. He doesn't get halfway across the court. And God calls him again because Hezekiah's up there having a prayer meeting. And God responds that quickly. And he turns Isaiah right on around and says, I got another word for you. Remember what I said about him not living and uh, dying and not living? Well, well, there's been a change of plans, and really there was no change of plan. But you understand what I'm saying from a human perspective. Uh, go and tell him, you're going to recover. And by the way, tell them, the them there, the plural pronoun, is talking about the caregivers, whatever they were, the court physicians, the king's personal medical staff, whatever it was. He said, you tell them to take a lump of figs and to make it into a plaster and to put it on the boil. And that's the cure. Maybe to the casual onlooker, it looked like, well, the court physicians finally came through. They finally figured out a cure. But you and I know better. The narrative is, in, is clear. God gave the cure. And why? Here's why. Because Hezekiah prayed. Church, let's keep praying. Let's keep looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's keep living for God. Let's keep being a light in this world and a testimony to those around us. Let's love them, let's help them, let's encourage them, and let's pray for them.